What's going on, everybody? My name is Linwood. Thank y'all so much for being here. And I hope that you are so ready for the next hour that is jam-packed full of hope, positivity, optimism, gratitude, mental attitude, and a mental check, baby. So pull up a chair, grab a couple of shots, kick your shoes off, let your hair down, and relax because this will be the best hour that you have ever received. And I'm so excited for it, baby. Woo! Let's go. Joseph Jaffe is not famous. Me, Tom Arnold, I am very famous. I absolutely like, because it's very true. Like, I hadn't freaking heard of you until I was sitting on a Friday night. This is how bad my life is. Listen, fucker, uh, good luck. Good luck with your rebranding. Like, anybody knew what the name was before. What was the name? Okay, who gives a shit? That's a good name. Because it's got your name in it. You can pretend you're humble. You say, I'm not famous. And, uh, you know, uh, which you aren't. <laughs> so you're, not, you're just not being a, anyway but I hope you get famous doing this good luck to you I, I just want you to know that I practiced this word about 20 times to make sure that I did not mispronounce it I have a question has anyone yeah. ever said with all due respect and then not followed up with a zinger? His side of the bed. If I come in and I'm on the other side, you'll move it. Yeah, that's it, that's it. <laughs> which, which side do you hide? Well, with all due respect, you all make all a good point. <laughs> Cheerio Oreos! Toasted Oreos! Uh, mute. He's muted. muted. I, I, love what, I love what he's saying. He doesn't need <laughs> sounds. You're so small, you know, squishing your head, Joseph. Uh, you can. <laughs> do it with me, Joe. With all due respect, you really do look handsome, Bruce. Cheery Oreos! <laughs> Toasted Oreos! Look at you! You are I mean, insane! How did I do that? You're how insane. did I do that? You just made the intro reel. Yes, you did. Hey, I was wearing the pink shirt in, uh, in that intro, and I'm wearing my pink shirt again. Uh, which uh, shows you that, you know, the uh, the producer has a very, very small budget for wardrobe. And as you can see by this face, uh, no amount of makeup uh, can uh, put lipstick on this pig. Uh, so what you see is what you get. Welcome, everybody. And uh, tonight, as always, uh, it's a great show, but even a, a, a more spectacular show because well, you'll see who's on the show. I'll just tell you anyway. Nancy Duarte, Lady Siren, Jory Desjardins. That exactly. Sorry, Jory. Jory Desjardins. That's what happens when I try and speak French, uh, especially when I've, you know, had my glass of uh, not French, but uh, Californian cab. Well, I hope you guys are well. And remember, remember, tonight there's lots of things that you can get. For example... A Jaffe coin right now for those of you that are on rally.io that have registered or even if you want to register for the first time, uh, you can become part of the Jaffe economy. You can register and get a free coin. It is yours. It is my way of saying thank you for tuning in live. And this QR code is only live as long as the show is live. I love that little geeky, tweaky little nuance as well. Look who's here. Mr. Bill Gwerton is here and, and uh, you know, taught me how to sing, taught me how to come out of my shell. Because as you know, I'm a very inhibited uh, sort of person and I really need uh, coaxing uh, to come out of my shell. So Bill, uh, welcome to the show and it's great to have previous guests. And Bill, you are going to get a gift from me, by the way. Would you like to know what you're going to get? I am absolutely thrilled to tell you that today, today, I launched my first NFT. So the Joseph Jaffe is not famous slash Jaffe NFT has launched. What you see on the left in color uh, is an NFT that you can purchase. The base price is $54. And on the right, the gold sepia tone is my, why did it do that? It's not meant to do that. Go back. Uh, that gold sepia tone uh, is for VIPs, in other words, past guests and creators. So Lady Siren, Nancy, you will get the gold uh, ticket. I don't know if it's a golden ticket, but it's certainly a gold ticket. Bill says, whoa, 
Um, what do you get for this NFT? Well, what you get is a free ebook. In fact, the actual pages of this beautiful, beautiful printed book. This is a digital mosaic of all the pages in the book. You will get the ebook, and it actually contains the first 50 interviews ever on the show. In addition, you will now get a pass. You will get access to pre tapings, to audition shows, to reunion shows. And there are some little Easter eggs as well, maybe backstage passes as well. So, this is just another way that we build this community, that we build this economy, um, that we build this together. Manif says, I got one of those. Thank you, brother. Manif got a VIP NFT today. Manif is just one of the regular viewers. And I wanted to be able to recognize and reward my regular viewers. You are not just community, you are family. Manif, it gave me a lot of pleasure to be able to send that to you. So if you want to find out more, just go to nft.rally.io forward slash Jaffe Juice and you can buy an NFT. Um, and, you know, the beautiful thing about it is you can actually resell the NFT. And I think, I think you get 90% of the profit. So you could buy one for $54. You could sell it for $50,000 if you wanted to and if someone would pay it. And you get to basically keep most of the profit. So this is, it's, these are amazing times that we are living through. It is a time where the creator economy is growing, is thriving. Uh, Fanzo is here. He said, I snagged NFT number 499. Congrats on the launch. Thank you, Fanzo. And Fanzo is our Wednesday Mental Health and Mental Wellness Wednesdays correspondent. And you will hear from him tomorrow. So we're building something great here. And I'm so happy that you're all a part of this wonderful little experiment. I'm so happy that, uh, well, Bamani was amazing yesterday, Brian tomorrow, Dion on Thursday, but Nancy Duarte, Queen Nancy, the famous Nancy Duarte is here. She's a CEO. She's a best-selling author. She is, you know, she is the Yoda of, of presentation and presentation skills, and, and, and people just love her, and, and I'm very, very humbled and privileged that she is here tonight. And then afterwards, the very famous Lady Siren is here. She is a creator, she is a poet, and she will perform for us. And I just cannot wait uh, for that. Knight's uh, seated soliloquy. And, you know, surprise, surprise, it is connected to my guest. And surprise, surprise, it is called Keynote. For someone who delivers keynotes for a living, I sure am using an antiquated approach to my presentations. I pretty much trade it on, tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, and then tell them what you just told them. From a storytelling perspective, I guess I would turn to a traditional arc with a beginning, climax in the middle, and end. And now that I've watched my guest tonight, Nancy Duarte's TED Talk, I must admit I'm both embarrassed and intimidated to see how it's really done. To be honest, I don't really have any structure in my presentations. I go with the Jaffe patented system of ordered chaos. And when I usually utter the words, I don't know what the hell is going to come out of my mouth, it's more true than not. Now, that said, Nancy makes me want to become a better presenter. Also, tonight's conversation couldn't come at a more opportune time. We're all dealing with this massive shift towards virtual as a temporary but perhaps more permanent replacement to in-person events and presentations. And truth be told, what we call virtual is really an underwhelming spin on a webinar where our slides are large and our poor faces have become reduced to the tiniest of thumbnails. Where's the innovation? Where's the creativity? Where's the beef? Where's the surprise and delight? This is why I now deliver all of my presentations as an episode of my show. And it's also why I'm hosting and producing custom episodes of my show for corporate clients as part of their training, development, and internal communications agendas. I'm more interested in newer approaches that can perhaps even, you know, or maybe not replace, but certainly at a minimum augment, enhance, or even evolve the status quo. 
like the education equivalent concept of the flipped classroom. What is a flipped keynote? About a year ago, I predicted that we would see a new model emerging where 24 hours before a conference begins, a keynote's presentation would be unlocked for attendees to view multiple times if they desired. Perfect viewing for the flight, for example. They would be able to take notes, pause, rewind, assimilate and integrate at their own pace. Now at the actual event, the keynote would host an in-person spirited and informed Q&A and conversation based on their presentation and of course attend the obligatory networking drinks and dinners. So that's my take on how we can make sure we didn't waste this opportunity to tell better stories. But will we respond? Time will tell. Now, time doesn't have to tell at all because it's time for Nancy Duarte. Known as the storyteller of the valley, Nancy Duarte is CEO and author of six, count them, six best-selling books. For over 30 years, Duarte Inc. has worked with the highest performing brands and executives in the world. The insights from those engagements get transformed into training everyone can learn from. Duarte is a communication expert who has been featured in Fortune, Time Magazine, Forbes, Fast Company, Wired, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Cosmopolitan, Cosmo, LA Times, and on CNN. As a persuasion expert, she cracked the code for effectively incorporating story patterns into business communications. She has two grandsons and a granddaughter. I'm going to have to ask her uh, about that. Nancy, welcome to the show. Hey, it's so good to see you, Joseph. What is a granddaughter? That's a... It's a dog that's owned by my son. So he has no wife, no children. So she's my granddaughter. She's like 16 years old too. So she's a, a ancient baby. Right. So in, in, in dog terms, I mean, you could be a, 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 well, in fact, I don't want to make you into a great, great, you are great. You are great, <laughs> but we'll just leave it at that. Um, so 16, 16 years, no doubt that dog has uh has had uh, a full life and hopefully uh, has many more uh, as well. So we wish your grand dog well. I <laughs> I am absolutely transformed by my dog. Yeah. I never thought I would, but uh, you know they're wonderful. Yeah, we're going to look at some puppies this weekend. We get to play with some new puppies, and so we're all excited. My husband and I are going to look for a couple dogs. Yeah. Wonderful, w wonderful. Well, you know what? We will. You will put the uh, dog search on hold. Uh, for just a, a brief moment, because it is Happy Evaluate Your Life Day, and uh, and and I have no idea what this what this image represents. Uh, sometimes Google confuses me, um, but uh, I don't know what's going on with the snake, with the alligator, what it ate. Uh, you know, there are bones. There's a turtle, um, but uh, you know, I did think there was something interesting, right? Happy Evaluate Your Life Day. First of all, it shouldn't have to take a special day to evaluate our lives. Uh, but certainly, I think it's true, Nancy, that, that you know, the last 18 months have been a golden opportunity to take stock, to introspect and, uh, and maybe pivot or, or whatever, you know, whatever it takes. Ha have you gone through that, that moment or, or those moments of the last 18 months? Yeah, I think uh, being owning and running a small business in the last 18 months, 20 months, or how God feels like an eternity. Um, I would say it was the most challenging time to lead, uh, but it was also possibly my finest hour. I wouldn't want to say I'm a, what would you would call like a wartime CEO, but I feel like um, there were a lot of hard decisions to make and, and I made them. And we had to flip our own company over. I mean, we were ready to go um, straight to work from home. That didn't slow us down. But based on what we do, all of our workshops had to become virtual. And we wanted it to be just like the Duarte experience. We wanted it to be immersive. We wanted it to be fun. We wanted it to just be consuming. And like people needed this place that wasn't like every other virtual meeting they'd gone to. And then we do work with the biggest, biggest brands in the world. And we had to flip their events to virtual too. So we had to scramble and uh, 
the, uh, the team rallied and, and did it very agile, very fast and uh, super proud, super proud of the team. Yeah, it was, it was trying. It was hard. It was hard. I had to change how I communicate too, uh, as a leader to the teams. And, and I learned how to dye my hair too, just the front part, because you can see that on Zoom. <laughs> oh well, that you know that that's interesting. Well, may, maybe you prefer the thumbnails. <laughs> you prefer to be <laughs> this size versus you know versus let's say that size, right? Yeah. Um, so if, if you like, you know, if you like, I can flip you and I can make you that size if you like. But <laughs> I give you the hero position, and I'm happy to be tucked away. Maybe because some of my uh, you know, uh, uh, slightly discolored hairs are showing. <laughs> That's why I have this loud background. Uh, but you, you spoke about, you said something that was interesting to me, how it made you uh, reevaluate yourself as a leader. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? What yeah. kind, what kind of changes um, or, um, you know, or, or self-awareness um, came upon you during this time? Yeah, so we, we've been around for 32 years. So this was like my fifth crisis. I knew we would, that happened to us, not anything we did on our own. So I, I knew we would make it through because we've saved for this. We, we had a cushion for it because we knew it was coming because they come in cycles. But what was really interesting was I wasn't prepared for how much I would have to um, comfort lead, console, make sure people felt brave um, and and give people the right emotional fuel to get through it, um, my team. And um, I did uh, video memos, a lot of video memos, a lot of uh, written memos, attended more of our internal kind of social things. But the, the thing that changed me the most was the resolve to the strategy. So we announced this beautiful strategy in January um, right before shelter in place happened. And it was beautiful. It was so beautiful that the team actually started a glee club so they could sing about the strategy. So we had traction right away, right? Wow. And then this instance happened where we were all just knocked off our um, horses. And we had to decide, uh, I had to decide, do we have the resolve to stick to the strategy? So this involved me on the service business side, the agency business, we canceled a hundred clients. We decided to focus on 25. Is that a move you make in the, in the middle of an economic downturn? No. Like I, it, so it was this sense of a couple of things, stick to the strategy if it was the right thing. And did we want to keep doing that? And then the other thing is it pressure tests your values. It pressure tests them. And we found that we relied heavily, heavily on our values and our values stayed true. Uh, we didn't have to modify them. We didn't have to tweak them, you know, to make them fit the next crisis. They were tried and true and helped us get through. So it it's, was. It's a, cool. it's a great story. I'm I'm still just you know kind of uh, thinking about the Glee Club. I've never <laughs> I've never in my life heard of a Glee Club that that is uh, excited <laughs> about strategy. But neither. But, but you know, you said something, you know, and I always say that in 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 essentially three hundred interviews. Um, it's amazing when I hear something new and, and it happens a lot. I mean, make no mistake, but I love this concept of the Duarte experience. And I was thinking, mm -hmm. I wonder if there is a, you know, a Jaffe experience or, a, you know, my first company crayon, a crayon experience, or, or even this show, if there's a Joseph Jaffe is not famous experience. Um, you know, I've, I've, I, I'm teaching now and, you know, and I had Joe Pine who wrote the experience economy and nice. she said some. He said something amazing. He said the definition of experience, by definition, it has to leave a memory. Right. And, and it can be a good memory or bad. You can have a good experience or bad experience. Yeah. But to me, like this Duarte experience, whether it's for employees first, customers second, you know, is something that is memorable. Mm -hmm. and, and I just think more companies should implement and be able to say insert corporate name here plus experience and then deliver that experience. That's that's a really powerful concept. Yeah, and it's part of the promise, like your brand promise uh, to create the kind of experience that people will come to expect, which was easy to do in person, but a lot harder to wire in uh, when you're looking at the camera instead of at another human. So it, it, yeah, it's been really good. I love that book too, that book rocked my world. Uh, it, rocked my, it rocked mine as well, yeah. as, you know, your TED Talk rocked my world too, which, <laughs> which we'll get to. But we'll take a brief step back for a second, and we will go from the sublime to the ridiculous, uh, which is, before I forget, 
you know, we did send our private investigators into the field uh, and, and they found out that you have quite a mean streak. In fact, in fact, you went uh, uh, all Caddyshack uh, on, on some poor unsuspecting, uh, uh, there you go, that's the one I wanted, yes. on some squirrels. So you went full Caddyshack oh. on a squirrel population yes. and you loved it. So uh, would this yes. be an accurate, this is actually a photo, by the way, yes, uh, of me. you. Uh, and look at that smile on your face as you took out the squirrel population. <laughs> well, I didn't take them out at first. I warned him. I, I put mothballs into pantyhose and tied them and threw them into the tree because that's supposed to repel. Put big, slick plastic, was out there greasing it up so they wouldn't be able to get up the tree. Got the neighbors to trim there. Put put metal on their tree. I mean, I did everything to distract him. And then this weekend, we may or may not have about six squirrels missing in the neighborhood, maybe. But I don't know why they're missing. So, <laughs> I, my goodness. My goodness, dude. It, uh, we have an eight. We have a big pecan tree. They ate about five hundred pounds of pecans, and I was just like, "And my mother and father-in-law, they make candy pecans for everyone for Christmas." So my goal was altruistic: is to let Grandma and Grandpa make pecans for the small children at Christmas. So my motives were pure and true, but there may or may not have been some sacrifices made to save the tree. You know what? I, I was I was feeling really sympathetic, but now I feel that those friggin' squirrels, you know, they absolutely deserve it. They got what's coming to them. I warned them. I warned and, them 20 ways from Sunday. And we have a few people here. Just a little shout out to uh, Corvus, who was uh, a previous uh, creator on the show. Uh, and uh, I think that is Gabe. Uh, Gabe Liel uh, says, hello, everyone. Great to have you guys along uh, and and watching. Now, um, I want to get into um, your incredible, uh, and there, Gabe said hello to you. So there you go. <laughs> um, I want to get into this, not just this TED Talk, but but the essence of, of delivering a presentation. And uh, and one of the things in this TED Talk, and, and you know, please go out and, and watch this TED Talk. The beauty of a TED Talk, of course, uh, is that it's, what, 19 minutes. And, yeah, 18, uh, you know... Minutes, yeah. Yeah, and I just wish it would have been 900 minutes because I just wanted to keep watching. But one of the things that came out in in the, in this talk in particular is you actually show that that in fact the arc, the traditional arc, even of a story, the beginning, middle, end, uh, is archaic, right? It, there's a different way, and 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 you and you talk about this shape um, as the essence of of what a great structure of a talk should be. Tell us a little bit more. Yeah, but well, what's interesting is I, I knew, uh, I wrote a whole book about how to make better visuals and it was like lipstick on a pig. The content was still terrible, but the slides looked great. So I went on this quest. I knew the answer was in story. And you, you mentioned at the beginning, um, an arc has a beginning, middle and an end. And the middle has this rising and falling of tension. So I knew the answer of this rise and fall was in storytelling. And so I literally studied story, story framework, story structures from literature, cinema, everything. And I remember I told my husband, I was like, great speeches, you know, this pulsing, this rhythm, this cadence to him. And I'm like, baby, I think I'm ready to draw the shape. And the shape is, you showing it tilted. So the shape is really flat. It's like, I don't know, like pumpkin teeth or something. And um, I said, I think I'm ready. Go, honey, go golf. I'm going to work at the office. I'm going to draw the shape. And I drew the shape. And I, I thought if this shape is true, because I, I, I knew it worked for doc, Dr. Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. So I took uh, Steve Jobs's iPhone launch speech. I thought if it works for him too, then this is true. And I'm not digitally native. So I took little tiny bits of graph paper. So Steve Jobs's talk is about 20 feet long of graph paper. It's hysterical. And it was true for both. First thing I did when I realized that I may have found the form, I have a, a book called the hundred greatest speeches of all time. I skimmed it quickly to see if they all comply. And then I fell on my knees. It was a very poignant moment. And I'm not being melodramatic, but I cried. And I thought this is a lot of responsibility then, then I went and got uh, the speeches, some of the speeches that Goebbels wrote for Hitler. He was the media minister for Hitler and they worked. And then it scared me. And I felt like this is a lot of responsibility. Do I release this or not? Because it's a powerful tool. And I thought, you know, I just have to believe there's more good people than bad ones. And then that was when I 
produce the book and then the talk about uh, the book resonate. And um, I love that because it's changed a lot of lives, changed a lot of nonprofits, completely changed careers. It's so nice to make a discovery like that that's transformed so many lives. Well, yeah. you, you alluded to uh, to Martin Luther King's speech and uh, and yeah. and uh, I was watching this and and I mean, it's first of all, you could probably make an NFT of this. Uh, but but it, it, it's 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 very visual. In fact, you can you could probably make some NFTs of all of these. Um, it it it's very visual and it's very you know it almost looks data. like it, it, it almost looks like design. So so and there's there's so much there's so much nuance because it isn't just about the you know the peaks that there's you know your your graph kind of like uh, horizontally. But yeah. what are the colors, the pinks and the and the yeah. greens and, and, and the blues? What's going on here? Yeah, that's a really good question. So I the actual um, book Resonate has that almost like a centerfold. It's beautiful. I had to pay 10 grand just to use the rights to actually print his speech in the book. Wow. Uh, what I did is I highlighted every word. So the words are there. Everywhere, the length of the bar uh, determines the length of his phrase, the stanza. So this is, he writes more like poetry, which is great that, that we have an actual poet on with us. So his stanzas were like poetry. So they were brief bursts, but the different colors, I don't remember the exact colors here, but some of it was pink, uh, really strong rhetorical devices. Uh, some of them were Psalms, scriptures, spiritual hymns. Definitely the orange ones were political phrases. He was basically standing in front of the um, Lincoln Memorial and quoting from political cultural, like the Constitution, Declaration of Independence, kind of throwing the words back in the face of the politicians, which was so powerful. So every one of those is a color code for the nature of the words that he was saying, how long they were. And then the undulating, the kind of um, back and forth is like when he states what is, what could be, what is, what could be, what is, what could be, at, kind of at the um, paragraphical level. Um, yeah, the the book has a, a fold out where the whole speech is there across two um two of the spreads and it's just stunning it's really stunning there are two things that um that resonate with me i mean there's more than two things the first is the fact that um you know we almost think in and and clearly it's an oversimplified way to think very binary you know problem solution yeah. you know you start off with a you know here's a problem if I take even my book Built to Suck, right, which is the coming corporate apocalypse, and he has a solution. And your approach is different. Your approach says pulse, 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 pulse. Keep doing it. Keep doing it. Keep building. But it's this constant, it, it's rhythmic. Um, and it's and it's this flow of, you know, push and pull, you know, push them and then pull them yeah. back. And so, so so that's the first thing that that I take away from it. The other one is, and, and this is a this is kind of a weird one. It almost, and I don't want to say, I'm not going to say formulaic, but it seems like science, precision science. <laughs> and I think, but where's the art? Where's the, you know, you don't think yeah. of of premeditated, it. deliberate in, you know, whether it's, you know, from from the good Martin Luther King to the evil of Goebbels. And yet when you go back and analyze. It is precision, you know, speech writing. So those are the two things that I take away from from looking at that and listening to you. Yeah, it, it you know people keep saying, oh, that's great that you made us a formula, and I was really careful at the end of the book. I put in a section called a coda where I analyze. I had my son who's a composer. He analyzed uh, a Beethoven sonata and a Mozart sonata in the same visual language to show that a sonata has structure and form, but a Mozart sonata is very different from a Beethoven one. So the intervals, the length of time that you spend in what is or what could be or what is what could be, it's very flexible because no two sonatas sound the same either. No two speeches should. It shouldn't sound like I'm talking about what is, now I'm talking about what could be. Because the, the difference between problem solution, which some people use, is we're appealing to the imagination, which is a completely mm. different form of appeal because you're trying to influence, persuade. So you have to appeal to their imagination. You can use analytical, you can use emotional appeals, but it's a different type of appeal that appeals to their imagination. And uh, that's the difference between um, how a lot of organizations need to influence. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I would imagine when uh, you said this book was was it the the hundred the hundred uh, best speeches was it hundred or yeah hundred greatest speeches of all times it's called <laughs> and, and, and I'll bet you to your point that you know those are a hundred sonatas but when you go back and look at them no yeah. two speeches are probably exactly the same so no. it is a it is like a it is like a a, a piece of art um, but there's only one you know one of its kind and when you put exactly. it together you understand the portfolio and the variety and the diversity in the book i think i analyzed eight talks eight different talks in detail and since then i've delivered about 20 different um, of those models and they're all very different that's wonderful well i uh, i want to i want to pivot slightly um, but before I do that, I always try and find a quote uh, for my guest. Um, and, uh, and this is what I found for you, Nancy. Uh -oh. it, you, uh, you probably know exactly who said this um, because you know the space backwards. But it's, it usually takes me more than three weeks to prepare yeah. a good impromptu speech. Yeah. And it's that true. was... Yeah. Who, who did you say? I thought it was Churchill, right? You, you know what... Generally, they're one of two people. It can be uh, Churchill and Mark Twain. This was Mark Twain. Oh, is that one Mark Twain? He, yeah, the other one where he said three weeks to do an hour. I need, and then, it, no, he needed, um, how did it go? If you want an hour speech, I could deliver it now. If you want a 10 minute speech, I need two weeks. That one is Churchill, right? Yeah, and I, I would have written a shorter letter, but, uh, but I ran out of time. <laughs> exactly. Um, so, so the last question about this and then and then I want to get into this you know this pivot and what this new environment looks like because you you said something in in our in our when we were communicating before the show that really kind of struck me um but the the thing that I just wanted to talk to you about is this idea of planning and preparation and deliberation and premeditation versus the concept of spontaneity and impromptu uh, is it more in, is it more perspiration than it is inspiration when it comes down to delivering the perfect speech or the perfect keynote? Wow. Oh, wow. If you try to do it perfectly, your humanness won't come out because everyone will cheer for someone slightly flawed. I think it's interesting, and I don't want to go full stereotypical here, but extroverts will tend to just be like, let's just wing it. We'll be awesome. Right? But an introvert will think through something so thoroughly, their content is better, deeper, richer. They're just terrified to walk on a stage. So you have this like, it's just completely contrasting. So the the biggest thing that any presenter needs to do, the and this is embedded in the entire Duarte method at the core is empathy. So in storytelling, there's this lesser known um, attribute in Joseph Campbell's hero's journey, where he says, the protagonist, the hero of the story needs to put on the skin of the enemy, at least if just for a moment, like the, the Star Wars team put on stormtrooper outfits, you know, the, in Avatar, Jake became blue. Like he's like, oh my gosh, I became blue. These are not our enemies. These are not our enemies. So it's like a, a moment to understand who you're talking to. So spontaneity may work for one group, deep thinking and, and, and structure and thoughtfulness for another group. So it really, really comes down to deliver the content the way your audience, your audience needs to receive it. So it, it doesn't get that much more complicated than that. And some love people that riff and others are like, I don't have time for that. And they want it to be thoughtful and crisp and tight. So it really is about knowing your audience and delivering the information the way they receive information. I was actually uh, in in watching your TED talk, um, and uh, when you spoke about Joseph Campbell's hero's journey, um, yeah. I actually I actually jotted down the phrase servant keynoting, or servant presentation, or servant being a servant presenter, like a a servant yeah. leader, um, and it really is a beautiful customer centric approach yeah. that actually says, you know what, it's it's interesting, but it's irrelevant, you know, in terms of how much and how little and whatever. Just put yourself in their shoes, walk that mile in their moccasins, yeah. and uh, and that's why I think I and that's why you are the Yoda of uh, presentation because um, because it is it, it it is exactly that it is the ability to flip it on its head yeah. um, and uh, and and as you say in the heart of that is empathy. Yeah, 
The presenter is the mentor. The presenter's not, you feel like the hero, right? You're well lit, you're standing on a stage, you're talking the most in the room. But in reality, the presenter's the mentor is how we say it. Presenter's the mentor, which means you're there to serve and help your audience get unstuck. It's not about you, blah, 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 all the information you're trying to say. It's about you communicating information that helps all the people in the room get unstuck in their lives and create human flourishing. That's what presenters are supposed to do. Don't be fooled by the spotlight is what I jotted yeah. down. <laughs> jotted. Yeah. So, so um, let's, let's slightly change direction and talk about what life has been like. In my soliloquy, um, I spoke about how yeah. I'm now delivering uh, my keynotes in the form of a show, which is so non-traditional now with comments and banners and logos and, and, and having fun doing it because... I mean, let's let's face it. There's nothing more underwhelming and and you know and and soul destroying than than a webinar or a zoo or yet another Zoom. That's been my approach. But you you know you said something and it really struck me. You actually said that you have taken deliberate steps now to record your keynotes mm -hmm. and to minimize how many live keynotes you've deli you deliver. And so, I, by the way. I found it as well. I don't, you know, I, I saw Facebook reminded me the other day of an event I did in front of a thousand people. And I looked at it and I just look at I looked at it. I said, ew, gross. <laughs> like, it's like, I don't want to be there. Yes. You know, I like wearing my slippers while I'm, you know, while I'm hosting the show, allegedly. Um, so, so I'd love for you to talk about that because I yeah. mean, talk about a heresy. This is your bread and butter. This is your business personally and professionally. And <laughs> and and you're almost kind of like openly and honestly saying, I kind of like doing it from the comfort of my own home. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, yeah. And it, what's so interesting is uh, you kind of started to hint at it. Like, why don't we give the keynote away and then have the presenter here for a conversation? That's what I love. I love being thrown questions from left field. So think about it. I'm a, I'm a CEO of a medium sized growing company. We're hockey sticking it right now. I'm a public speaker and an author. So when the presentation lady does a presentation, I have to kill it. I, I can't be like, I can't goof up. I can't, yeah. I'm being judged by a different level than others are. So when I have an in-person keynote, like I have one in November, that's really high stakes to like most amazing audience. And I'm carving out three hours a week. I got to practice. I got to make sure that I'm not looking down at my comfort monitor too much, that my gestures are right, that I'm landing my jokes. That's a lot of pressure because I only deliver it live about six times. So I have to ramp up, ramp up. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. is that really the highest best use for a CEO to spend 20 hours in prep just to be stage ready for this moment? You know, and I'm, so I have to gauge the the events that are super high stakes that I love, like they play the video, I'm there listening, I'm just doing email, whatever. And then I pop on for the Q and A and I'm fresh, I'm excited, they're excited to see me. And I'm not seeing that big of a difference, I'm getting paid. I mean, I, I'm sending them out like crazy. So it's about a third the price, but who cares? You can just do them all day long. And that's not where we make our re revenue. Obviously I have training and we have services and stuff, but it, but it opens doors. It's like an emissary for people to be like, oh my gosh, I want to learn from her. So I just, and now people who are public speakers for a living, there are a lot of people like that. They can't do that. It, it cannibalizes their business, but my speaking gig actually supports my medium sized company. Well, you know, th there's one other point as well, which is when you actually, del when you produce a canned keynote, you can really, really, as you say, land yeah. everything. You can yeah. use but a teleprompter yeah. if, if you online. need to. Yeah. You know, the, the tech works. The editing is perfect. All the ums are taken out. You know, I hired a makeup lady. I looked awesome. So did I. I mean, I don't look <laughs> awesome. <laughs> but um, but but I, you see, I, but I, I also have laugh tracks now. So when I don't land the joke, you know, <laughs> because normally what happens is I make a joke and I, I get the cricket. So, um, and that's another thing I can do now with this, you know, and have fun. Uh, and by the way, and by the way, I've got one as well, which is I really like to say the word motherfucker. And, uh, and so I've got a bleeping, I've got a self bleep machine too. Um, so <laughs> it changes everything. Um, 
but but this was you know this was a this was a great insight and i think that um i think we've got to think about it uh, and realize that at the end of the day the content needs to be able to deliver what it was promised to deliver exactly. and it's less about it's ironic because this show is live there's a joy and a thrill of being live but for me the liveness of it is so that i can have manif say don't be fooled by the spotlight i love that i love being interrupted yeah. in a show and that's what it kind of is but on the flip side what you're doing now i have to believe is the future of keynotes i really do i do i think that well for me it's my future <laughs> And, and, you know, there will be a whole set of skills and a whole, you know, set of best practices going with how to produce, you know, the perfect, uh, the perfect canned keynote without sounding canned. Now, Nancy, I'm going to just completely change gears and, uh, and uh, talk a little bit about your, uh, your five-year-old grandson, uh, who uh, is a, a budding philosopher, because yeah. uh, he apparently... Uh, taught you about a concept called wasted love yes i think he might be the poet and the philosopher i think so uh, tell, tell us about tell us about wasted love uh, yeah. or wasting love i'm telling you my grandkids have spent every friday night with us for the last year and a half and they brought so much life and joy five-year-old and two-year-old now and they, um, my daughter has them stay in her bed. And at first we were like, no, that's just wrong. But you can get the internet to support any of your parenting beliefs that you want, right? There's internet right. to say it's okay. And at first my husband was like, no, no. And then we're like, now we love it, right? So we split up. I go in one guest room, he goes in the other. My five-year-old grandson, I love the mornings because he wakes up and he just kisses me. Grandma, you're so beautiful. Grandma, I love you. And she just kisses Grandma, I love you. I love you, right? And then he says, and he has this little bit of a speech impediment. He goes, Gra grandma love should be wasted. And I was like, I said, Mijo, are you, are you saying wasted? And he said, yes, wasted. And I'm like, what does that mean to you? He goes, you should always give love to everyone, even when you know it might be wasted. And I was like, oh my God, this guy is just so full of this selfless gushing love. And, and during, I have to say, during the season that we've been in, I have had to wait. I've had to spend time wasting love on employees who were mad they got laid off. On like whatever the situation is, I had to pour out love to those who didn't understand or to those who were hurt. Or you know, it, it's just been a tough season, and it slayed me. Absolutely slayed me. Mm. Uh, there's so much wisdom. What do they say? Out of the mouth of babes can come great wisdom, and yeah, he's my he's my little love. <laughs> love it. Well, well, you are not a CEO. Uh, you are a CCO, which is a Chief uh, Compassionate Officer. Oh, thank you. Um, and and that is the power. That is the new superpower of leadership, which is the ability to waste love. Um, I love that. Well, Nancy, just before I, I I let you relax in the green room and we bring on Lady Siren. Um, it is time for a uh, Jory de Jordan, and she is going to be uh, talking about something different other than crypto. So, uh, Jory, take it away. Hi, friends. It's Jory de Jordan, your crypto correspondent. And uh, despite my crypto curious t shirt, I'm actually not talking about crypto today. Rather, I want to talk about the current trial uh, that has begun with uh, now disgraced. CEO Elizabeth Holmes of Theranos, a health company, healthcare company. Um, for those who haven't been familiar with what's going on, she was called out in a series of articles and a now famous book about committing fraud and making fraudulent claims about the company. And some of these claims actually were harmful to the public. So now tech is up in arms. We want, we want blood. That seems a little odd to say, given what Theranos does. But anyway, I'm of mixed opinion here. I can't say I've been a fan of Elizabeth Holmes. Frankly, I think her style was really off-putting. I think pretending you're a man is not a way to build a company. Although, to be clear, she played to the standard of what investors expect of founders, which is to sell way ahead of your skis uh, and sell a vision before that vision is actually um, 
a reality. And in this case, that was a very harmful thing to do. Ellen Powell had a story. Uh, she wrote an article in the New York Times that sort of calls this out. Um, basically, we know we need to uh, have founders be accountable, but why not male founders too? Why not people like Adam Newman of WeWork, who had sold way ahead of himself before WeWork was even the, had the value that it had and walked away with literally millions and millions and millions of dollars for his transgressions. And Travis Kalanick of Uber and other founders who have per perpetrated things that we don't really want to see perpetrated in society, but because their companies were too big to fail, they walk away. But the female founder, out for blood. Something that I hope we all think about and hopefully we'll have a standard that would match across the board. I'm not saying let's allow founders to get ahead of themselves to harm society because they need to uh, hit a quarter, but I do think we need to think twice about the standard that we hold our founders to and the differences between male, female, black, Asian, Hispanic, and hold them all to the same standard. That's it for this week. Well, Nancy, I know in the back channel you were saying totally agree. Um, I, 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 will, I will give you the word to respond if you like. I agree. Like I kept thinking. So a lot of my CEO friends here in the Bay Area were like, who's going to go and surround before the big exposure happened? Everyone could tell you can't do that. Like chemically, you couldn't do what she was saying. We were like, somebody needs to go protect her. Go. Who do we know? Who knows her? Who's one degree of separation? And she'd isolated herself a lot. But I also see like Martha Stewart went to prison for a tiny itty bit of insider trading when dudes on Wall Street have been doing that for decades. So there is disparity between what she did and is getting going to trial for versus what the men that she mentioned have gone through and not had to pay a price for. It's almost like it, 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 the more opportunistic you are about your ideas, the more money you get thrown at you with the exact samples that she gave. So I haven't heard anybody say what she has said before. And I think we can say it because we are women, um, and I completely agree. I don't, I don't condone what Elizabeth has done. I mean, she came in to our shop wanting a deck to make her into Steve Jobs, right? And so she had, uh, uh, there was a, a grandized view of herself and maybe that's why she's vilified a little bit in the press, but um, yeah, I thought, I thought her point of view was super, I took notes, so I thought her point of view was super interesting. Well, that's why we love Jory, who is a previous guest on the show as well. And of course, Jory is getting an NFT as well. Everyone gets yeah. it. You get an NFT and you get an NFT. Yeah. Um, you I'll make you one. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Thank you. I need, and if I need design, I know who to go to. Uh, if you want to be able to uh, improve your presentations, and uh, I mean, it's just more than that, right? It's uh, Nancy, you are, um, you are the Yoda. Uh, of uh, presentations, presentation skills, keynoting, communication, whether you're an introvert or an extrovert. Uh, if you're ready to be trained, uh, go to linktree.com uh, or linktree -E, uh, forward slash Nancy Duarte. Uh, also, there's a guidebook series, and the first is by Patty Sanchez on presenting virtually. You can get that at duarte.com forward slash presenting dash uh, virtually, of course, check out Nancy's fabulous TED Talk. Uh, there are free resources at duarte.com forward slash Nancy. And uh, you can just connect with her wherever social media is sold uh, or even given away Instagram, Twitter, Clubhouse. Uh, just before we bring on Lady Siren, and, and Lady, even though we're a few minutes uh, over, don't worry. I will uh, not steal any moments away from you. Two final comments. Uh, Todd Churches says hi to Nancy from uh, Todd in NYC. Hi. And Michael Torres says it's really about understanding the intersection between the stories our audience wants us to tell and the stories we want to sell. Uh -huh. Hi, Joseph. Last time we connected was at the AB InBev Stanford Executive Marketing Program many moons ago. You voted my viral video the best content in our exercise. LOL, Nancy, I've been a huge fan for years yeah. and years. But Mr. Universe is saying, Lady Siren, Lady Siren, 
Uh, Lady Siren, we're ready for you. Bob Farnham adds another show I'll have to watch again. You do that, but Nancy, we will see you uh, shortly. Thank you so much for being on the show. Of course, I'm excited. Let's bring on Lady Siren. Let's, <laughs> let's do that. Uh, so, Lady, I've seen her. Uh, she has been in the uh, green room. I've seen her rehearsing uh, feverishly. Let me tell you uh, a little bit about her. Uh, she is uh, uh, I, she is a mother of one, uh, a legal guardian to her youngest brother, loving partner to uh, her special someone. Uh, her name is V. Uh, she is a dope friend, child advocate, gymnastics coach, fitness instructor, and of course, Lady Siren, the poet and creative, all in one humble little soul. Is there anything she can't do? We will have to find out ourselves. Let's bring on Lady Siren. Welcome to the show. Hello, hello, peace and blessings, Joseph. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, we, we made you wait a little bit, but good things come to those who wait, I hope. In fact, I don't hope, I know. Um, we're very, very excited that you are here. Um, and uh, you have a lot of uh, fans. Uh, Candy W <laughs> says, can't wait uh, for Lady Siren. And Mr. Universe says, that's my friend. Um, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to disappear and I'm going to ask you to uh, introduce uh, what you're going to be performing. I know you are performing a poem, uh, so take it away. And when you're done, uh, Nancy and I will be back to chat a little bit to you. All right. Sounds good. All right. Um, peace and blessings, everyone. Um, thank you so much for the space, first and foremost. Yes, I will be um, performing a little piece tonight. Um, it is a piece that is um, that is pretty close to my heart, and it's becoming like a bigger and bigger affirmation for me. Um, the more and more I recite it um, and kind of get that feedback and positive energy um, from those that are hearing it, um, and it, it's, it's quickly becoming one of my favorites. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to give you of shadows and light. <clears throat> Sometimes you remain in the dark so long, it becomes easier and easier to forget just how beautiful you are. When you immerse yourself in unyielding shades of black and gray, it becomes harder to keep our minds from being consumed too. Life will come at you, swift and blunt, instruments of that sing of our demise and of form of those we trust. Realize they will lie to you. More than speak untruths, they will scar you. Batter your energy, disfigure your being, but not just physically. At times, you adult wounds so deep it cuts through your soul, so you retreat into obscurity in an effort to heal, withdrawing from the world around you and close your eyes because you'd rather not see the damage. We're afraid afraid of shining light on even the good fragments of ourselves for fear of also seeing the parts of us that are broken, misshapen, or even slightly tattered. You do not have to sacrifice the bit of you that remains intact to cover up those vulnerable places, resort to yank every star from your very own sky endlessly night. Who'd want to wish upon a glint of hope when, with every disappointment, another shovel of dirt is thrown into the hole you're standing in? With every failed accomplishment, dark thoughts moves you to have a hand in burying the bruises on your body. Look closely. They are a part of you, embedded in your skin. A mental grave is a cold, dirty, disorienting space to be in, but nobody is coming to dig you out from beneath the weight of your own mind. So whenever you're able to open your eyes just enough to let a little light in, open wide and let it shine, because all of you deserves to be seen and loved. To succumb to darkness indefinitely is to lay down and be buried. You are worth more than self-imposed eulogies. You deserve to feel all of life's sensations, although you prefer numbness over feelings. I know. 
It is easier to seek the safety and loneliness, but to be alone is to be without challenge and to be without growth. How do you appreciate the warmth of the sun and everything that thrives in it if you're never thrown into darkness? It is unfathomably cruel to think what your brain can do to you for no apparent reason at all. But your well-being is a collection of things all coming together and not necessarily all at once. Number one, being the desire to survive. It is a fact of physics that in the presence of light, darkness isn't completely vanquished, but it is severely diminished. The key to this is preserving the beacon of your consciousness, grounding a higher power in the center of your spirit so the fire of your will has to burn brighter than a pain that crowds you. And that is true. That sometimes an illness requires medicine. But what if it's your thoughts that are sick? When you begin to evaluate the situation, you may see that you have a bigger hand in remedying it. The mental battles are the hardest to win. The mind is the hardest thing to train, but it's a muscle nonetheless. And you reinforce its strength each and every time you make a decision to try again. And I choose to bask in the glow in the sun because my glow will always be bigger than the shadows. So love yourself into your healing. You, you, you deserve that much. Thank you. That was so beautiful. The only way you can write something like that is if you've spent time in darkness, right? And have to tell yourself every day to come out of it. That's beautiful. That was beautiful. And I feel, I feel that in a way, uh, even you know, I could almost see uh, your your chart, Nancy, your visualization. That I felt like, like, like Lady Siren, that you were. You were taking us through that, yeah. uh, you know, through that that journey. We were going up, we were coming down. We we're going up, we were coming down, yeah. and yeah. it was that pulse and pulse. It was so the imagery, right, into the mm. grave, out of the grave, out of the shadows, into the light. It was really beautiful, really beautifully done. Thank you, awesome. thank you so much. And yes, that's exactly it. Um, you know, I felt like the piece mirrored, you know, a, a real life process of what it's like to go through that daily struggle. You know, we all have things that happen. We have those bad days, bad months, bad, bad couple of months sometimes. <laughs> um, you know, so it's definitely a constant battle to kind of keep yourself on track because there's those days where you're like, I know I got to do X, Y, and Z, but I really just want to lay here and like just sleep and just not be social and not be an adult. I don't want an adult today. And that's what that battle is. That's what that poem is all about. <laughs> yeah, we've been tell doing a concept that our office, it's like, know thyself, love thyself. Because you can't, there's a scripture that said, love, lo says love others as you love yourself. Like we can't love others till we love ourselves. So that was really well done. Um, Brava. Very good. So I have, a, I have a question for you. You know, uh, you, you've obviously, you're active in Clubhouse and what a perfect, perfect platform for voice first, voice only, you know, audio first. Um, but tonight you did this through video and I and I have to say, I, I, pref, I prefer video. I, I want to see your face. I want to see the emotion. Um, I also think there are nice ways to, I don't want to say cheat, uh, but in both cases, you know, you can... You know, you can use visual aids or read or whatever. I, I actually moved to something that that I don't normally do when I keynote. I use a teleprompter when I do my my monologue because I actually wanted to train myself to get better at being able to to read and choose every word carefully and deliberately and get better at cadence. And for me, it's a new test. Mm -hmm. But I have to say, like, if I had the choice of listening to you on Clubhouse or watching you as I did tonight. Every day I would prefer I would prefer sight, sound, and motion. But maybe that's just me. Thank you so much. I mean, that's my that's my preference. You know, I like everyone has been through some changes 
right? <laughs> this past year has been changed. Um, so, you know, Clubhouse was definitely a nice, you know, bridge between um, creatives and everything. But as things kind of kind of normalize, um, you know, there's more open mics. I'm kind of getting back in some of those live performances. Um, I would love to thank my ninth grade um, communications teacher. Uh, for all of the speech practice. Um, so it's definitely my preference as well. So I, I did feel like this was in a way a keynote, uh, in a way uh, you were like a teacher or as, or as Nancy says, you were like a mentor. Um, there was something very, very um, engaging and as emotional as it was, it felt safe. And, uh, and I also just want to say that, you know, uh, Candy says she has a great face. Uh, Mr. Universe agrees. We prefer we video to audio. Uh, Symbolic Knight says, can I have your autograph? And Nick <laughs> says, great poem, Lady Siren. So you have your fans. Nancy, you have your fans. Uh, and uh, number one fan, I guess, is me. I'm a fan of both of you. Um, tonight was great. I want to make sure Nancy, uh, Lady Siren, want to give you guys the final, the final words um, and of course, please, please support uh, Lady Siren. Uh, she is uh, she's more than just a creator and a poet. You are so multifaceted and multi-talented. You can follow Lady Siren on Instagram, uh, obviously uh, in the club, in Clubhouse, uh, and uh, and send some tips her way through Cash App or PayPal because we are operating in the creator economy. You are a creator. I'm a creator. Nancy, you are a creator. We are all yeah. creating content. We are inspiring. We are teaching. Um, and, you know, tips make the world go round. So there you go. Uh, so Nancy, Lady Siren, final words go to you. And then someone is going to come in and try and actually have the final word because <laughs> he will tell you whether he thought you guys were hits or misses tonight. So Nancy, the floor is yours. And then Lady Siren, you get to bring us home. My final word is I'm hoping everyone recognized how um, there's so little crafting of words like you could hear in Lady Siren's body of work there that the word choices actually shaped it. Like I actually had the opposite reaction. I closed my eyes because I heard word. I could picture things in my head just flying. So I would implore everyone to apply what you just learned from her in your body of work. Take the time to craft words that make it's so people see what you're saying in such a vivid and beautiful way and feel what you feel. Beautiful. And Lady Siren, before you bring us home, Michael Torres says, thank you, thank you, thank you. You are all brilliant. Lady Siren, you took me to church. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> I am so, so, so very humbled by everyone's reactions and comments. Thank you so much for getting those up there for me to see. Um, I, I truly appreciate that. Um, it is humbly received and radiantly returned. Um, I hope even if you don't remember the pieces, the, the words that I said in the poem, that you remember how it made you feel, carry and capitalize on that feeling. That's my final words. Awesome. All right, and so Chuck Norris, what did he think of Lady Siren and Nancy Duarte. You are Chuck Norris approved. <laughs> well, there you go. Uh, Imani, Elaine, uh, send some hearts our way. I will be back tomorrow night with Brian Feathersnow. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you for watching the show about hope, positivity, optimism, and if there's time left over, a little bit of marketing with your host, multiple author and global keynote speaker, Joseph Jaffe. If you like the show, tell a friend or two. Please subscribe to the show. And if you want to get inside news, previews of upcoming guests and much more, visit josephjaffe.com slash subscribe to sign up for the show's newsletter. And despite the best ministrations of your wife, you still look ugly. <laughs>